Why wouldn't we start? Yes. Let us start. <laughs> I was looking for the for the time. <laughs> Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's a real uh, pleasure and uh, honor. Uh, Sasha was an extremely inspiring teacher of mine when I was a graduate student. He taught an incredible course at MIT. I just remember going to this course on the uh, T from uh, rushing out of a course at Harvard jumping on the tee to try and get to the start of his course. And then coming back, my head was just so full of amazing mathematical ideas and uh, ways of thinking. It was incredible. I mean, thank you so much, Sasha. That was just a really amazing. It's uh, one of my clearest memories of graduate school. And uh, well, so I want to, um, I had, there was a title, maybe I'll, There'll be some connection between the talk and the title, but uh, maybe I want to explain some things to do with kind of arithmetic language, which is a little far from, I think, most of the other talks, but uh, hopefully will be interesting to some of you. And so the kind of setup, well, we could have a, a number field, which I guess I'll just take Q, and we could have G, some reductive or maybe any simple group this is yes yeah oh. so this is well this is reductive or semi-simple group and we form uh and so the kind of thing that uh one is interested in in number theory is Uh, this kind of a quotient where we take the real points of our group and we quotient out by the maximal compact subgroup. And then here, this is a level structure to this gamma sitting inside the Z points of G. And uh, uh, cut out by congruence conditions on the matrix. For example, you might look at matrices that are upper triangular modulo n or that are trivial modulo n for some choice of n. Um, and uh, one is interested in, for example, the uh, homology or cohomology of these uh, locally symmetric spaces, since those are supposed to be connected to, for example, Galois representations. And well, there's another sort of way to describe these, which is uh, a little more abstract to write, but makes them a bit easier to think about at a technical level. So such a thing is more or less the same as looking at the idyllic points of G, so now A is the idels. So you do the usual thing where R becomes the idels and Z becomes Q and the level structure gets moved over to the right. So we still have K infinity and we have now KF. So K infinity is maximal compact in the real points and this KF is compact but open in the finite idyllic points. And that measures the level structure. And this object 
So we'll just call y of kf, where, I mean, probably there's all kinds of different notation, but uh, if you take g to be, for example, SL2, then this quotient is the upper half plane, is SL2 mod SO2, is the upper half plane. And so this kind of thing is a modular curve of some level. And there's some tradition in at least some part of number theory where a modular curve of some level is denoted by the letter y. So I'll just write y of k. And so, uh, well, the kind of thing I'd like to do is consider the cohomology of uh, this y of kf. So maybe we'll consider the cohomology in all degrees. So we can write it as a, a gamma f with coefficients. Well, I'm a number theorist, so I want to do some arithmetic. So maybe I'll take a, well, ZL cohomology for some prime L. And maybe it doesn't matter too much for the talk, but I'll take compactly supported cohomology. And this has some structure. Well, it's, it's a complex compute of, which computes uh, the compactly supported cohomology of YFKF, and those are finally generated ZL modules. Um, there's, there's an important algebra that acts on here, which traditionally denoted uh, capital T, which is so-called Hecker algebra. And uh, I'll say a little bit more what it is in a minute. So, um, so it's what sometimes number theorists will call the anemic Hecker algebra. So, uh, anemic means that we only think about Hecker operators coming from primes that don't divide the level. So, uh, so it's kind of a build up out of spherical Hecker operators. But uh, an important thing when number theorists think about this Hecker uh, algebra, they don't mean the abstract spherical Hecker algebra, or they don't mean a tensor product of abstract spherical Hecker algebras. They mean the image of that thing in the actual endomorphism ring. So, uh, so if this cohomology were all zero, then this would be the zero ring. So, um, So there's a, uh, so there are two sort of modifications I want to make to the cohomology, which is sort of important. So one is that we can put in uh, local systems. So we could consider, uh, we could look at um, this KF and uh, a typical way to make this KF is just to choose a kind of level at each prime. So to write it as a product over finite primes, which all this, I guess, write V uh, of a kind of KV, where for almost all, for all the finally many V, KV will just be the um, sort of ZV points of G, but for uh, some finite set of V, this KV will typically be smaller, and that will be where you have level structure. And we could choose uh, sigma V, some kind of representation of KV. And I'm sort of doing this ZL coefficients. So I'll take this sigma v to be uh, the zero representation. And actually, so let's say, I could even say like kind of finite module. So on some z model to the m module, because if I wanted to study a zl module, that's kind of an inverse limit of z model to the n module. So I may as well do z model to the n and get, and get rid of topology. And then here I could sort of say continuous, where this just has to discrete topology. 
And I want sigma v to be trivial for almost all v. And so then I can form sigma, which is kind of a tensor product of over all v, v sigma v, which kind of makes sense because these are almost all trivial. And so that's kind of a representation of this KF. And so then, and then this could be a local system, kind of L sub sigma on Y of KF, because I, I, uh, I quotient it out by KF. And so when I, before I do the quotient, I can just use sigma I can just product with sigma to get a sort of trivial local system. Then I can quotient out by the diagonal action of KF and get a local system on Y of KF. And I could consider the cohomology of this kind of local system. So that's sort of a thing I can do. I have to try and work these plots, which is going to be super non trivial, but. And for this, ah, so now, well, maybe I'll just say it. So this Hecker algebra will also act on, you can get a Hecker algebra acting on these guys. And so, so I have a, a sort of an interesting thing that choosing my, um, choosing this group G, I get some kind of uh, I get some kind of functor. I mean, it's not exactly clear where it's defined right now because the KF is varying. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, before yeah. I question out by KF, I can sort of put a copy of sigma, okay. and then let's question it out daggedly. Um. So, so I kind of have a, a functor that I put in a sigma and I get out some complex. So uh, there's kind of another way to describe this function, which I just want to, I want to say, which is that I can also, I can kind of do the following thing. So I can, uh, so I'm going to put some kind of tilde here. And what I mean by this yeah. I sort of take a limit over all my level structures of this compactly supported cohomology, an inverse limit under the, under the trace maps as the level changes. And so this thing has an action of this kind of Hecker algebra and also an action of GAF. And so that's the kind of complex I can make, which has commuting actions of these two structures and uh, and that other cohomology I had can be computed from this one basically by tensoring with a uh, so this thing has an action of all of the finite ideals. In particular, it has an action of KF. And so I can kind of tensor with the uh, ZL grouping of KF with the sigma, and that will cut me back down to this uh, cohomology. And this I could write in another way. Okay. 
Yes, you're right. So I should be a little bit careful. So let me have, so maybe, so you're right. So it's probably uh, this I should, uh, I should choose a finite set of primes and just take this limit where I keep the level structure to be kind of fixed away from this finite set of primes and take a limit of all these set of primes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here, I can just uh, put, I can just kind of do this. Some of the type of. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is also a CD tensor. And, and this thing is also called the compact induction of sigma, the compact okay. induction from K to G. Is there a F, lowercase f missing on the Y of K at the very left? Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. So, uh, so, so another. So the reason I wrote this is just to say that this, there's really sort of the way to organize all the different local systems uh, independently of choosing a level is to think that you can induce. If you have this sigma, which is a representation of this kf, you can induce it up to g of af, and now you have a gf representation, and so. And then you have this, then you can produce this kind of cohomology, which has a description sort of as this function. So you have this kind of cohomology at infinite level and you tensor, which has an action of the uh, adelic group and you tensor with this representation of the adelic group and you get some cohomology at some finite level of some particular local system. So, um, so what I'm writing is just a standard way to organize some kind of constructions in the cohomology of our locally symmetric spaces. But what I want to, uh, yeah, so, so maybe I should say, just before I say what I overall want to do, I promised that I would just say for those who are super familiar where this T comes from. So where this T comes from is that if you start at level like G of ZV and you look at its trivial representation, this formula kind of shows you that you could have gotten that situation by first of all going to infinite level in V and then cutting back down to trivial level in V by taking invariance under G of ZV. So even if you don't put V in the level, if you just don't put B in the level, it looks like there's no structure at the prime V. But if you remember that you could have gone to infinite level and then come back down, you realize that actually, when you're at trivial level for V, you're in some invariance under G of ZV for infinite level in V. And in that situation, the spherical Hecker algebra acts. So that's where the, so that's where the uh, Hecker algebra comes from. So you look at the spherical Hecker algebra acting at all the primes that are outside this set S. That I had, yes, that I need. So, what I want to say is that we have a kind of process that takes in representations of the adelic group and spits out, well, modules over some heck algebra. And uh, to some extent, well, one of the kind of points of categorical arithmetic Langlands, which is a reasonably recent thing, is to categorify, in some sense, this function. So, or geometrize and categorify geometrize. Uh, so, the, so the first point is that this Hecker algebra, just to back up. So I'm gonna say things and some of them will be theorems and some will be conjectures, but, I'm not talking since I'm not talking to kind of 
like uh, the normal people I talk to. And hopefully people aren't going to hold me too much. Like, I don't think, hopefully I was going to go and try and build a Langlands bridge out of the things I'm saying. So let me not try to be too precise about what's conjectures and what's theorems, because to show you what's theorems is a super technical thing. You have to be, start to be very, very careful about the G and the number field. And I mean, it's, it's a real mess to say what's precisely true. So let me just try to say what's supposed to be true. So uh, they'll, they'll give you hopefully a couple of examples where there'll be some actual statements of theorems. But... Yes, let me... In some sense, it might be better to do some kind of completion. But maybe let me suppress that technical point. Yeah. But to, to, but to, uh, to first approximation, yeah, let's say locally constant functions. Um, but the, the, so the thing about this Heck algebra, what does the Heck algebra have in it? Well, at each prime L, or V, say that's not in our set uh, S. This thing is uh, it's a kind of a quotient. You get a quotient of the abstract spherical Hecke algebra. So the spherical Hecke algebra by Satake is parameterizing conjugacy classes in the dual group. And so here we're getting a quotient of that algebra. So we're getting a subspace of the space of conjugacy. So we're getting a you know, closed sublocus of the uh, conjugacy classes. So we're getting uh, a certain list of conjugacy classes. But we're actually, but this is built out not just of you know, one prime, but all the primes outside this set S. So, uh, so that means that the kind of, uh, the spectrum of this T is giving us uh, collections of conjugacy classes in the dual group labeled by the primes outside S. So how, what's the other way that you will produce a collection of conjugacy classes in a dual group labeled by primes outside S? You will take your representation of the Gala group of Q into the dual group, unramified outside S, and you would look at all where the Fabianus elements go, and that will give you the list of conjugacy classes. And that's basically what's supposed to happen. So that, uh, so kind of, uh, the points of spec P kind of give certain tuples kind of of uh, hundreds of classes in P hat labeled by primes that are not in S. But there are representations from G. So, so I'll write GQS to mean the absolute Gala group of Q unramified outside S and to say G hat say Q O bar. Also give such tuples. So you take rho of the of V for V not in S. And kind of these sorts of things, so these these are supposed to match rough. I mean, and so um, so. The um, so what so the sort of first idea is that we so from a T to a stack X, which maybe we'll call X GQS G hat, which Parameterizes these rooms. And maybe then we should sort of. So we might, if we could, 
you could impose some conditions. I'll give you an example in a minute of what I mean by imposing some conditions. And yes. In the sense that, so, so, it means that T be the global sections so we could call this X if we wanted to. So the pro so T will be the global sections. So basically T will be like the GIT quotient of this stack. Um, and Uh, yeah, in the examples I'm going to write down, I guess, actually, you'll just, there'll be no derived in the examples I write down, but yeah. So, And so then we uh, then we want to find the um, G of A F reps uh, sort of G of G A F reps to say here in sheaves or maybe complexes. X, so maybe uh, maybe like uh, there's just some cook here in chief, like in the pie, such that this cohomology. Yes. Will be global sections on X of uh, and, y. and then so this for here in sheaf will have a be a sheaf of O module, so the global sections will be a uh, a T module. And so that's the um, so that's sort of the the kind of uh, kind of global sort of categorification I'm talking about, I guess, or geometrization I'm talking about. And um, further, uh, sorry, yes, sorry, sigma should be. In this case, yeah, I'm sorry, sigma should be the sigma I had before, so the compact induction. Pi should be the compact induction. Thank you. Yeah. And then M should be, well, I mean, M is global, but M should be a product of local things. So M should sort of factor some kind of tensor product V. And B. So there should be. And so this uh, factorization we, uh, so we have sort of So we could look at, uh, as well as having a stack of global representations, you could have stacks of local representations. So representations of the decomposition group at each prime P. And we could look at, and we could imagine having functors MV taking, say, the derived category smooth representations of G of two V, and maybe incoherent sheets on X V. 
and we would so we could imagine functors like that and then we could if we have our global yes we could we have a restriction to the look product of the local bytes and then our like this guy was sort of a is some kind of tensor product of local guys. And so the, the kind of candidate recipe here would be that, so here we would have, maybe we would have this MV for each compact induction of sigma V. And then we could kind of exterior tensor these all together And then we could uh, pull that back. We would do F up a shriek to have that be a coherent sheaf here. And so this guy might be F up a shriek of these local bytes. And I should put in a factor for infinity. And then, and that will be kind of a, uh, well, that will be, a, that's a picture that we want. So the picture that we want is that producing cohomology, which is a module or chain complex of modules over the heck algebra is a shadow by taking cohomology of producing coherent sheaves on moduli stacks of Gower representations. And that the, and the just as the kind of, uh, just as kind of, Automorphic representations have a kind of factorization. The kind of coherent sheaves you produce should have a factorization. And so the situation should be described by uh, local, uh, by these sort of local functors. And these functors are conjectured to exist and are conjectured to be fully faithful. And they will be the categorical local lemons functors. And so, so that's sort of the, the overall framework. And uh, I have, I guess, another half hour. There's sort of a lot to say about it in some sense. And also, if you are only allowed to talk about theorems, then there's less to say about it. But, um, but, so, but one, one key, so, so one thing is that um, in the global picture, there were all these primes V and there was this L. But so in the local picture, there's sort of a prime V and there's also an L, which I sort of suppressed, but there's an L. And when you're thinking locally and you have a prime V, that you're like it's Q, Q completed at V, and then you have these coefficients ZL, or maybe when you're working locally, you could call VP, because already v, P is a better word for a prime than V. So you maybe have QP and you have ZL. So it's a big deal whether L equals P or not. So, uh, because studying l gamma representations of a decomposition group of P is much easier than studying p gamma representations of a decomposition group of P. l gamma representations of a decomposition group of P are essentially just classified because wild inertia of P can only act through a finite quotient on an l representation. And so, uh, so, for example, the Swan conductor is a constant in families, and so if you have a moduli stack of l representations of the decomposition group of P, that we connect the components, for example, indexed by the Swan conductor, and you can kind of study them separately, and a lot of the computation in some sense comes down to the tame part, and so that's one story. If you take L equals P, then the study of p representations of, of a of the decomposition group of P is basically the, uh, that's the province of Piatti Koch theory and related ideas. And there's a much more complicated theory. The possibilities are much more complicated. Again, essentially, it's just because uh, the wild inertia is a pro P group. And you're mapping, you're taking Piatti representations of a pro P group. There's just all kinds of possibilities. And so the ramification can just be much, much worse and much. It's a very, very different situation. So that's kind of one thing. Uh, but if you take L not equal to P, then this fully faithful embedding will be a part of the 
probably least well known by name, uh, Fag Schultz uh, geometrization. I mean, Fag and Schultz have a sort of formulation of a geometric, of like a geometric Lang lens where you replace, so global unramified geometric Lang lens, the way you replace the usual curve that you would do global unramified geometric Lang lens for, you replace that usual curve by the so-called Fag Fontaine curve, which is not a curve, but is some curious scheme or attic space or something connected to piatic Koch theory. And you then try to do global unramified geometric Lang lens on the Fag Fontaine curve. And you get a story, which in particular will give you this fully faithful embedding if, if the whole story was proved. And, uh, and when L equals P, there should be such a fully faithful functor and less is known. And I'll say something maybe a little bit about it at the end. But what I want to do is um, try to show you a little bit what these spaces look like. So I think, um, so one feature of when you write with Adele's and an arbitrary group G and so on, it's just a lot of symbols. And uh, one of the features of number theory is that it's a, traditionally has a lot of examples. And so I want to show you, I mean, these things are not so, so bad. And I want to show you some examples to show you what sort of things we're talking about. And so uh, I think I'm here. So to, um, so let me try and give you a sense of what some of these things could look like. So maybe I should say, that uh, defining x eqs is uh, work in progress with uh, in Renju. So this will be some kind of derived formal stack. So it's a, little, has a chance, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna give you some, an example where it's a classical stack, a classical formal stack. And uh, so start defining XV when it's not equal to V is not so bad. And lots of people did this. So, um, so this is sort of a, So defining the, the thing is defining these kind of stacks of um, Gower representations is a little bit complicated because what you would like to imagine is that the Gower group is a finally presented group, and you're just looking at a representation stack of a finally presented group, and that will be a fine thing to look at. But the Gower groups are not finally presented groups; they're they're uh, kind of profinite groups, and so so it's a little bit tricky to think about how their representations move in moduli. But if, as I was saying just before, if you're doing elatic representations of the decomposition group at V, then wild inertia at V will always have to act in a constant way in any connected component. And so, so it means that if you kind of fix how wild inertia acts, you're basically studying representations of the tame Gawa group. And the tame Gawa group is a for a finite completion in a very natural way of a finitely presented group, which is a very easy finitely presented group. And you can just write this thing down. And that's done by many people. And uh, um, it's not so bad. Defining xv when L equals v is done in the case of GLN. By myself into a VG, and it says a moduli stack. So,
So this is sort of a moduli stack of the gamma module. So this is the most elaborate. These are the moduli stack of representations of the beta ling group. This is still a little bit elaborate. This one is actually literally just going to be a moduli stack of representations of the gamma. So this one is somehow actually the easiest to define. And but let me show you kind of what it would look like. So here's sort of an example where I'm going to take. to be PGL2 and I want to look at uh, so I'll have my stack X so this is uh, sorry my my s well, kind of infinity and then I'm going to allow replication at 5 and at 11 and so X is going to be Sort of moduli stack fibatic representations of PQS dimension two. And then I'm going to put some other conditions. So I want to put so the conditions will be. So I want the determinant to be the cyclotomic character. So that corresponds to here, I'm looking at PGL2. So I'm looking at automorphic representations of GL2 that have trivial central characters. So they represent PGL2. And so putting cyclotomic character on the determinant of instrumental representation matches <laughs> that. And then I want to be finite flat at five. So that's a condition on the behavior of this five adic gamma representation locally at the prime five. And I don't want to say too much about it, but I'll tell you what it, what it means on the automorphic side in a minute. And I want to say unipotently tamely ramified at the prime 11. And Trying to hit all of these at once. Oops. Wait, which one do I want? Is that the one I want? I think that's the one I want. So so what So, so these conditions on the Gala side correspond to two. On the automorphic side, they correspond to weight two modular forms of level gamma zero eleven, which some of you will know is a famous example. So the so in the prime five is the so-called Eisenstein prime for this level. So in Barry Mays' famous Eisenstein ideal paper. This is kind of the first example. So it's the first kind of interesting example where there'll be some moduli stack that is different to the Hecker algebra itself. And, and you can draw this stack. So, but maybe I should remind you. So in, so in, in modular forms of weight two in gamma zero 11, that's a two dimensional space of modular forms. There's an Eisenstein series. And then there's a cast form. And the cast form just happens to have a famous formula, which is just kind of a coincidence from the point of view of this talk. And, and so since the space of cast forms is one dimensional, this cast form is automatically a Hecker eigen form. And uh, Y011 itself is an elliptic curve with two punctures, you might call the cast zero and the cast infinity. As, def as defined over Q naturally, it's a mod modular curves and naturally curves over Q. So it's an elliptic curve defined over Q. 
It's also the first, so it's the first example of a modular elliptic curve. It's modular, this modular form is the modular form that shows you that it's modular, or the fact that it is a modular curve shows you that it's modular. Uh, but the Mellon sum of this modular form will be the L function of this elliptic curve. Um, and it's also the sort of so-called first elliptic curve in nature. So if you look at a table of elliptic curves, this will be the first one. So 11 is the smallest possible conductor of an elliptic curve. Of conductor 11, there are three elliptic curves of conductor 11. This is one of them. I'll mention what the other two are in a minute. So there's two other elliptic curves. There's one isogeny class, because it's just one cusp form, but there are three members of the isogeny class. And we'll see what they mean in a little minute, what the other, but, but this is one of those elliptic curves in the isogeny class. So, so you have these two cusp forms. And so the Hecke algebra, we're working phyletically. So the Hecke algebra, what does it look like? Well, it acts on E2. And so you get a copy of Z5 acting, for, acting on so, I mean, if, if we were doing complex modular forms with complex coefficients, this, the heck algebra would just be a C cross C. There'd be a copy of C acting on the E2 and a copy of C acting on the F, and they would they're two different eigenvectors. You just get a C cross C. But the key thing is that these two modular forms are congruent mod five. So the heck eigenvalue is a congruent mod five. And so the heck algebra is. Uh, Z5 plus Z5 glued along F5. And so what does the X look like? So what are the um, what are the actual Galois representations? So, so the E2 has some constant term, which is going to be uh, 11 minus 1 over 24. So that's going to be kind of so that's going to be like five twelfths, and then n equals one to infinity. So d divides n, but d co prime to eleven of d. So, so it's a little bit times q to the n. So that's this e two. The key thing here is that if n is a prime different from eleven, then the coefficient. one plus p. And that's supposed to be the trace of Frobenius on some Galois representation. So what Galois representation will it be? So the basic rule is that if you have a systematic way of writing your trace as a sum of two numbers, and it's a kind of systematic way of doing it, that will mean that the representation maybe is a sum of two representations. So one way to get trace one for every group element is to take the trivial representation. And one way to get trace P for the Fibanius at P is to take a cyclotomic character. And so this basically will correspond to the trivial character direct sum, the cyclotomic character. The, the thing is though that um, when you take a trace, you can't tell whether you had a direct sum of characters or an extension of characters. And so you can definitely find an extension of trivial by cyclo, where so where trivial is a sub and cyclo, or, sorry, trivial is a quotient and cyclo is a sub. And one way you do that is you take uh, fifth power roots of 11. So if you take fifth power roots of 11, you get a Kumiko cycle that describes an extension of trivial by cyclo. And when you take fifth power roots of 11, uh, 11 is a unit mod five. So you're taking fifth power roots of the unit locally at five. So, so this finite flat will be okay. And this unipotent at 11 will be okay. And so, but, but we didn't allow ramification outside five and 11. And if you took fifth roots of five, that's definitely not finite flat at five. And so, so actually 11 is the only kind of thing we can take fifth roots of. And so basically the only extensions we can find of trivial by cyclo uh, as a kind of a one dimensional space of extensions. So, and so we get, so this diamond brackets means I phyletically complete. So this is kind of a one dimensional, this is a kind of phyletic completion of an affine line. So that's a one dimensional thing. And I take its formal spectrum. So this is the description of this X. And then I should 
but there's some uh, kind of conjugation action on these extensions. So it should kind of push it out by some GM hat. So maybe I call the variable here T and T times X will be the action of T on the variable X will be T squared X. And so that's, so that's, so that's a quotient stack. So that's kind of the generic fiber. If you invert five, you get a kind of a closed unit disc. And then if you kind of reduce mod five, so this kind of is supposed to be saying like you, here's the generic, the generic fiber, here's kind of the mod five thing, mod five, you get F fiber join X, so you get a line. Okay. So that's one component and the kind of corresponding to this E2. But then there's also this F. So this F gives you a five value representation. And what is that one? Well, that's comes from the five value take module of this elliptic curve. So that's coming from the five power torsion on this elliptic curve. And uh, if you look at the five torsion of this elliptic curve, it's actually, yeah, what to say? So famous theorem of Sayer, which you could definitely not so hard to check in this case, would be that if you look at the five value take module of this elliptic curve, it's an irreducible representation of the Galagos. But if you look mod five, it's not irreducible. If you look mod five, there's a, there's a five torsion point. So you get a copy of Z mod five Z, and then you get a complementary copy of uh, the fifth root of unity. So, that's, so there are two subgroups. There are two uh, Galois invariant subgroups of, of the five torsion. And that's how you can take five isogenies. So you can take five isogenies to move around and get two other isogenous curves. And so, the tape modules of those kind of curves give you, give you different Galois representations. So in fact, let me draw the picture first. This kind of, so that's supposed to be the boundary of an annulus. And that's the five adic tape module of one of the curves isogenous to this one. And then that's the inner boundary of an annulus. And that's the tape module of another curve five isogenous to this one. And then this curve itself has a tape module and that's gonna be kind of a circle in between. And how do I get an annulus with kind of these three circles all defined over Z5? Well, I have to do, so let me write it here. I have to do this form of spectrum of Z5, I join X, Y, with X, Y equals 25. And then I have to portion out by GM hat. Because so this annulus is where x equals one and y equals 25. This is where x equals 25, y equals one. This is where x and y both equal five. There are other Gawa representations you can make that are kind of lying in between, but they would not be defined over Z5. There will be points of this stack which are defined over a ramified extension of Z5. And and the, the, the variable t here acts t times x equals t squared x and t acting on y is t to the minus two times y. And if you kind of reduce this thing, well, you put five equals zero, you get f5 and join <coughs> xy with xy equals zero. There's a few more your picture, an annulus who generates the two lines crossing. So you have two lines crossing. And then this line and this line, you kind of, you should glue them. Because they're the same. They're both just corresponding to extensions of mod five trivial by mod five cyclo. And this other line is corresponding to extensions of mod five cyclo by mod five trivial. So extensions the wrong way, which live in characteristic five, but they don't live to characteristic zero. And so, so you get these two pieces kind of glued along this common orange line. And if you take the global sections, this torus action kind of kills off the variables and you're just left with a Z5 and a Z5 glued along a common F5. And so that's an example of a stack of Galois representations whose global sections are giving you a heck of a So that's the um, kind of, uh, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about promoting P to a stack. So now, um, So 
So now, uh, what, uh, so what sort of the, um, what's the local stack at 11 going to look like? So we said this, we're supposed to, uh, so to map this to a, uh, a product of local stacks and do, and do something. Well, the, um, because of my conditions, the only thing, the only kind of contribution in this F upper tree picture here, the only contribution here will come at, a, will be from what happens at 11. So what does, so here I'm looking at X11 and I'm also asking that I'm tame unipotent. So what could happen? So we're looking at tame Gower representations. And so they just, he does a particular way tame inertia, but also where the tame Gower group at 11 goes. So Frobenius can go somewhere. And the most typical situation is that your representations are numified. And then Frobenius goes to some matrix, which has a trace. And we can essentially describe the situation as just this line of traces. And then, but, uh, but if the eigenvalues are Frobenius uh, 1 and 11, which is like 1 and p, so trivial and cyclothomic, you can get a non split extension of trivial by cyclothomic by extracting, well, the same thing I did globally. I can extract roots of 11. And so, so there's a point here. So maybe we'll call this an X which is a trace of Frobenius of 11. And there's a point here that maybe I'm going to sort of subtract off 1 plus 11 so that here when X equals 0, there's a, there's a line which is kind of classifying of one by sigma. So that's sort of it basically. So, and really I should, I mean, I should be drawing pictures kind of like these ones. I mean, the coefficients should be Z5. And so maybe just not do that too much. But so, so, so this picture is basically uh, the following one. But I X, Y. Equal zero, like the GM, where P acts on XY, it acts trivially on X, P, and it acts by P on Y. And so, uh, so that's the, um, That's the kind of local picture at 11. And so one thing you can see if you look at the global to local map, for example, is that this Eisenstein part globally maps onto this line, onto this component locally. So if you compute this F upper shriek, you're doing an F upper shriek, so you're doing a shriek pullback when you have a line mapping into a two lines crossing. So that's not a complete intersection. I mean, that's not a local complete intersection map. So this F upper shriek will have some non-trivial cohomology. So for example, I mean, it's a kind of a incredibly elaborate sort of explanation as to why this compactly supported cohomology of Y011 will live in two degrees. It'll live in degree one and also in degree two. But the degree two part of compactly supported cohomology only has a kind of Eisenstein aspect. It doesn't, the cusp form only contributes to degree one cohomology, the Eisenstein series contributes to degree uh, one and two. And, um, and sort of in the geometric picture that will be related to sort of the geometry of this global stack mapping to this local stack. So, uh, 
So I'm kind of almost out of time, but I just wanted to say that I want to just illustrate what these local functors are supposed to be. So, so on the on the on the representation theoretic side. So when I'm looking at kind of on the Galois side, tamely unipotent representations, on the representation theoretic side, I'd be looking at the so-called Iwahori block of smooth representations. And the Iwahori block of smooth representations can be thought of as modules over the Iwahori or affine Hecke algebra. And the affine Hecke algebra has a pretty simple structure. In terms of this X, it's just C5 adjoin X, X on C5 adjoin X, C5 adjoin X. Okay, the center is C5 adjoin X. That's the sort of spherical Hecke algebra, the X trace is generated by the trace of Frobenius. And this is the affine Hecke algebra. And uh, if I call this that, I call it X11. So this X, so I'll write it as a, as a direct sum. And I'm writing it as kind of a, as a, as column vectors, because then you can just make this two by two matrix act on these column vectors. So here, push out that y. So this, so this, uh, this guy acts on this thing. For example, the main thing you need to check, I mean, is that uh, here we have an x. Here I quotient it up like, like this term is supposed to map this to this. So that's a bit bad because you're mapping a quotient to the thing that it was a quotient of, but it's okay because you have an X here. And so when you multiply this Y by X, you get zero. And so it's well defined. So in fact, you can compute the derived aha. I mean, this is a, a coherent sheaf on this stack. You can compute it self aha. A self aha is compute such so in degree zero and is, a, is exactly the affine Hecke algebra. And so just by general categorical principles, the existence of this bi module, which is you know an OX module with this whose R his self R home is the affine Hecke algebra, that just means by the reader theory that you get this functor from the Iwahori block into coherent sheaves on this guy. So that's, for example, the kind of thing you're doing to try and build these functors. You're trying, I mean, one way to think about what you're trying to do is you're trying to write down certain explicit bi modules. Um, at the very start of my talk, I wrote down this R gamma tilde, which was kind of the universal bimodule, if you like. That was like, I didn't cut down to any, any block. I just went to kind of infinite level and I just had a representation of the periodic group itself. And so, um, so the sort of, uh, So the general functor from uh, smooth uh, GQP reps into uh, incoherent sheaves on XP should be given by some kind of bimodule L infinity over XP, where this will be a um well, pro here chief and so let me just uh finish by saying that there's a theorem of uh Andrea Dotto that we've kind of uh made the correct L infinity for the case of GO2 over QP uh, for L equals P. So the kind of piatic Lenman's case. Uh, so using our stack of P gamma modules and using the known, starting with the known connection between piatic Lenman's for GO2 QP and P gamma modules, we've been able to build on that and build this kind of kernel for the functor 
in that case. And so, so I believe this kind of whole picture exists and makes sense. And uh, at least in the kind of first non trivial case, we can do something. Well, so thank you for listening. And uh, I'm just looking at your vertical line. So uh, you see the extensions, right? Yeah. So is it like the usual Langlands correspondence and tells us, for example, if you take a pure motive, then it tells you what to expect uh -huh. that it should pr produce a more representation, but it doesn't tell us anything about mixed motives. Uh -huh. extensions. So is it conceivable that your stack somehow could see mixed motives, see extensions? Um, or it's yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, yes. So because the usual language correspondence doesn't see it at all. Yeah, because so here, so he, so I guess in the usual language correspondence, somehow locally, right? Like if you have a globally irreducible guy, then locally it can become an extension. And in some sense, I like, I mean, when Langlands was first formulating his correspondence, the tape modules for semi-stable curves were kind of a weird thing. And then they realized the Steinberg is what's describing that. So this is like the Steinberg line. So, so somehow this local line is the Steinberg. So it's, so it's not sort of new in some sense, but globally, definitely, because globally, this guy is extensions globally. So these are really mixed motives. These are extensions of trivial by cyclo, and you're really seeing extensions. And uh, somehow, when you go to um, the ring of invariance, like the usual T, that goes away. You don't see that structure anymore. So, this, so the stack is definitely seeing kind of mixed phenomena. Uh -huh. And it's related to kind of, and it's kind of in, from the point of view of cohomology, it's kind of sh showing how those phenomena are related to cohomology away from the middle. So, so it, it, it's really absolutely new because there was absolutely no way to see mixed motives before in language fiction. And related question, how about Archimedean? Yeah, so, so, um, so the Archimedean prime. So, uh, so one thing I should say is that I've learned from Schultz of this. So Schultz has some uh, picture which would include this as a some kind of um, shadow. But so in particular, there's some kind of uh, fog Schultz with infinity, which should be true, but hasn't been worked out, which I don't fully understand in any or don't understand. But there's a kind of more elementary way to, under, to think about what happens in infinity, which is that when you study Gower representations coming from Cohomology symmetric spaces, they will all, I mean, it's not proved maybe, but it will be true that they will always be odd. So, what does odd mean? So, when you look at the L group of G, there's always a canonical, there's always a canonical kind of odd involution. So, in the conjugacy classes of involutions, there's a canonical one in P, which deserves to be called odd. So, um, and uh, like for GL2, it's just a conjugacy class of one, zero, zero, minus one. So it's this generalization of the odd condition that appears in like the fontaine mesa conjecture or says conjecture. And the uh, things you get will always be odd. So let's suppose, at least let's work in um, if L not equal to two so that the involutions can't be congruent to each other. Then when you look kind of, you can just look at the sort of um, like stack of gala C over R. And so you, so you can look at that's the, the representations of this group of order two into the L group. And okay, well, so inside there, I mean, that's a disjoint union over the different involutions of basically components labeled by the involutions. And so one of them is this R guy. So this R guy is a point modulo the stabilizer, modulo the centralizer of that odd involution. And and so there should be a coherent sheaf that you want to you want to put. So that basically, there should be some coherent sheaf you want to put on this, which will kind of be the factor at infinity in my formula. And so you have to find a representation, a kind of a good choice of representation of this stabilizer. And you know what the dimension of the coherent sheaf should be. And if you just look through the list of all the odd involutions in all the different root systems for for the real groups, you kind of can always find a representation. Um, but in the case of a Shimura variety, you can discover this representation 
another way. So in the case of a Shemur variety, there's always this um, Shemur datum H, and it gives you a co-character mu. And the co-character mu gives you a representation of the dual group called V sub mu. And so that V sub mu gives you the contribution at infinity. So, so in the Shemur variety case, the representation of the stabilizer, it kind of extends to a representation of the whole L group. And that's where the Gower representation comes from. But in the general non shimur variety case, you'll just get a representation of this stabilizer. So that's sort of the story. But I don't understand. I mean, I didn't know real groups very well. And when I looked in, the, in Wikipedia, basically, to find a list of representations of real groups, and so, so I wanted to try and figure out if this thing always existed, this representation of this stabilizer. I did, but sometimes the, the dimensions are like 90 something, and you were looking for a 90 something dimensional representation and you found it, and it seemed a little bit miraculous. So there's definitely something going on, but I don't really know what it is. Um, but it's like uh, if people here have read Langland's letter to Lang, where Langland explains how he first discovered V sub mu, it was also something kind of miraculous. I mean, he did really like, he looked at tables of representations of certain Shimura real groups, and he just discovered always there was some kind of irreducible representation V mu, and it was a miracle. And later, Deline explained why that's there. This is somehow, yeah, so it's, anyway. Other questions? Does anybody have questions? There's a question over here. For L equals P case, uh, there's a uniform treatment at the level of crystalline cohomology. So can you translate this uh, geometric Langlands in terms of that? So you're asking, is it kind of a crystalline version? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there should be so somehow. I'm a, I mean, I'm, May, will make me a little bit nervous to um, start putting P in the level and then do uh, crystalline cohomology. Like, does it, like if I was going to put, start putting P in the level and then do sort of piadic cohomology, I'd want to be careful about what I was doing. Crystalline, log crystalline. There's a question of what you're going to do, but uh, maybe you should be doing prismatic cohomology. But I'm yes, there'll be some kind of. I mean, I think the general principle will be that uh, sort of. Anything sensible you can write homologically should come about in this way. So, for example, in the function field case, um, in some sense, automorphic. So, in the function field case, it basically makes sense to have automorphic forms themselves take values in QL or QL bar. And so then you just have a formula, I guess it's called Grimfeld's formula. The analogous formula would just compute automorphic forms as a pullback as a pullback, the global sections of a pullback of some product of local pieces. Uh, somehow in the arithmetic setting, we don't really know how to sort of talk about automorphic forms themselves being QL valued or QP valued. But any, so we have to use um, kind of cohomology or something, but I think any proxy you have for automorphic forms that makes sense with QP coefficients, there should be such a formula. So may I, uh, so is uh, any arithmetic representation coming from like a lift of a geometric one or at the prismatic level or I don't know. Uh, I don't know, maybe we should talk afterwards because yeah, I sure. have to try and figure out, get my thoughts straight to figure out what's going on. All right, uh, in the interest of time, perhaps we should uh, discontinue a special thing. <laughs> Right. Um, am I fired now? Nice people, you know, we don't fire, 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 fire. So, um, now we have a reception. Let's go to the box. Uh, and also, uh, Coca-Cola. Best way to enjoy the reception is to go 